I mean, he is. I mean, I like that song, The Goodness of God. And you know, have you thought about the number of times that, that we make excuses about things, especially in dealing with things that are good, right? And so I want to have a little bit of fun. The goodness of God doesn't compare to, I don't know, the goodness of ice cream, but the goodness of ice cream is pretty good, right? And so like, we can make excuses about things like that. Like I say, you know, like, ah, I can't have ice cream because, well, it doesn't settle well on my old tummy like the way it used to. But they make this really cool bottle of stuff called lactate, right? And if you eat enough of those things, you can actually eat ice cream. So don't worry. I'm going to chug me a bottle of lactate, and I'm going to enjoy some ice cream this afternoon, right? I don't want to make an excuse, you know, and, and miss out on the blessing and the goodness of ice cream. But sometimes we, we go looking for excuses too, right? Have you ever realized that? Like, you know... Yeah, it might be like a fun time at the pastor's house, but, you know, there's people, and it might be there's too many people, or it's too hot, and I don't want to have to get out of the car and walk the distance from the car to the house, you know? Uh, and so sometimes we look for excuses, and then we miss out on the goodness of what? But in ice cream, yes, both of those things. Yes, you miss out on the goodness of the things that God provided us oftentimes himself, just as Stormy shared. Today, we're going to look that if we're not careful, our excuses cause us to miss out, not just on the good things, but on the goodness of God. And we certainly don't want to be going looking for excuses to miss out, because to me, that's even worse. So let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to bless our time together as we get ready to jump into his word today. Dear Jesus, we do thank you for this day. God, we thank you for your goodness. Yes, we are thankful for the goodness of ice cream, but you are so much beyond that. That God, you, you don't just fill our belly, you fill our life. You satisfy us in a way that overflows. And so God, I pray that we will set excuses aside today and say yes to you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So if you have your copy of God's Word today, we're going to be in Mark chapter 12. We're going to be picking up the story of Jesus in verse 18 is where we're going to be going. And historically, Mark wants us to see the significance of this last week of Jesus. That's where we are at in his earthly story. And so we know that Jesus came to the temple on a Sunday and that everybody celebrated that. On Monday, Jesus came back to Jerusalem where he cleansed the temple. With his return on Tuesday, Jesus was met in the court of the Gentiles, and he brought to light the rejection of the work of God by those religious leaders. And as he walked further into the temple that day, he shared a parable, a parable that prompted a personal examination that you and I, well, we need to examine our lives, and they examined theirs. And it left those who received his truth, that those who examined and said, yes, I want that, man, they had an amazing promise. The amazing promise is that God would be with them and be with them forever. But those who rejected, well, this truth, they understood that they and they alone were responsible for their own guilt. And as these religious leaders rejected the truth of Jesus, they are now coming at him to cancel him, to catch him in some sort of verbal argument or trap in order to cause him to fall out of favor with everybody else. And this is where Mark, Mark, Mark writes and where we pick up in verse 18 this morning, where it says, some of the Sadducees. So last time we were talking, it was what? It was the Pharisees and the Herodians, right? It was the elders. Here, it's the Sadducees who say that there is no resurrection. They have come to Jesus and they have begun to question him, saying, teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves behind a wife and leaves no child, that his brother should marry the wife and raise up the child to his brother. As we go on in verse 20, it says, There were seven brothers, and the first took a wife and died, leaving no children. The second one married her and died, leaving behind no children. Last of all, 
Uh, excuse me, the fig, go back. Verse 21 says, The second one married and died, leaving behind no children. The third likewise, in verse 22, So all seven left no children. Last of all, the woman died also. So we've got this question, and man, it has descended into this hyperbole, right? You're going, holy cow. And so they ask this, In the resurrection, when they rise again, which one's wife Will she be? For all seven had married her. And so, yeah, okay. And so Jesus says to them, Is this not the reason you are mistaken and do not understand the scriptures or the power of God? For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. But regarding the fact that the dead rise again, have you not read the book of Moses? So they have quoted him, and now Jesus is taking them back there. In the passage about the burning bush, how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the living. You are greatly mistaken. And so we're going to kind of pull apart this really bizarre question and Jesus' response to it. And you might be thinking, what relevance does this have for us today? And that would be a good question. And hopefully when we leave, we will see that. And so Mark wants us to see how our excuses are going to keep us from God, because that's what they do. We give up all sorts of excuses. I'll let you know, as a young person, I had a lot of excuses why I didn't want Jesus until I stopped giving excuses. Maybe you are that way too. Does it mean all of our excuses are the same? I mean, sometimes we've had different things hurt us, different things happen to us. We have excuses even sometimes as believers, right, about why we don't continue on in faithfulness or why we will or won't do something. But the Sadducees, they doubted the power of Jesus, believing that some things were impossible. So they're going to doubt his power because it's impossible, right? See, they acknowledged God as the creator of all things. I mean, they were the religious leaders after all. And so they acknowledged that God had made everything. Man, think about the power in creation. Think about how that has to work. Think about all the things that you and I still yet don't understand, how even some of the smartest among us still don't understand all things about the way our world or our universe work. And so they acknowledged him as creator, but they struggled with the idea that God could make things different than what they were right then. You know, sometimes what we want to do is we want to put God in a box, and we want to see God through our limited ability. And so if we have a hard time imagining it, or a hard time thinking it, or a hard time understanding it, well, then we impose that upon the almighty God creator of the universe but yet God is limitless, is he not? I mean, we might get upset that we don't understand things about God, but I am totally okay with having a God that I don't fully understand. Because if I could fully understand him, then he is not all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-amazing, is he, right? Because my limited human broken brain can figure him out. I'm okay with not knowing and not understanding. Do I check my logic at the door? No, I don't. But I am okay not limiting God. I want a God that's limitless. I want a God that thinks outside the box. I want a God that says, hey, you think that's cool? Hold on. Watch me do this right here. Something that's never been done, right? And maybe he's done some of that in your lives. And maybe you're living testimony about how the fact that God does amazing things that somebody thought would never, ever happen. And so the words of Jesus communicate that he had the power to change our relationships with something more connective than marriage. Now, marriage is cool, okay? And I mean, God takes two people and makes them one flesh in an incredible kind of mysterious kind of way, right? To where you can complete each other's thoughts and sentences and know what they're thinking. And sometimes that's awesome and sometimes that's not awesome. You know what I mean? But nonetheless, God brings people together, but yet God's saying, hey, I can do something beyond the closeness that you know in marriage. Okay, that's definitely outside the box. 
that he has the power to change our purpose with something that's even more important than just mere survival by giving in marriage for procreation. Because that's one of the commands, isn't it, right? Go forth and multiply. That we have children, well, to create things and keep going, right? And so God's saying, I have the power to do something that's even more purposeful than bringing children into the world. More powerful than that. And man, that's an incredible miracle all by itself. I'm still amazed by the video that they have seen when they have actually videoed the moment of conception when, when, the, when the sperm enters the egg, that there's a spark of light, the spark of life that takes place. And God's saying, hey, I can do something even more amazing than just that. I can give you a different purpose. He has the power to change our activities with something more worthwhile and akin to the work of the angels in heaven. And so you think about the activities that we do here on earth, and God's saying, hey, I have the power and the ability to supercharge your activities, to make your activities something really worthwhile, because after all, what are angels? He's not saying we're going to be angels. You know, he's not going to say that we've got little wings and little halos or whatever you imagine. You know, you're not going to sit on somebody else's shoulder, you know, and do one of those types of things. What he's saying is that we will have an activity and purpose like them. Well, the word angel in the original language is messenger. We have the ability to be what? Messengers for God, to be able to proclaim, share his truth, and bring his word to all sorts of places, to be that which needs to happen at just the right moment and just the right time. Scripture tells us that angels announced some of the greatest things that we've ever heard and that they were able to do some of the most amazing things that we've ever seen. And God's saying, hey, we can be active and do things that even make that pale in comparison. And so the Sadducees, well, they doubted this power. Their doubt of this power caused them to miss out on the difference that he can make. So they made excuses, right? And so here's the biggest excuse. I'm kind of going to spoil something for you in just a minute. But they didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in the afterlife. And yet they have asked this question, right, about something that they didn't even believe. This very act is an excuse of them trying to say no to the things of God. We do stuff like that. But it's not just that they doubted the power of God. The Sadducees dismissed the truth of Jesus by believing some things were irrelevant, okay? They quoted the Word of God. They said... Moses said, and Moses said those things. In fact, they quoted the word of God for their own purposes. But the selectiveness of what they said de-emphasized the overarching beneficial nature of Scripture. So yes, they quoted something for the point of argument, but they ignored other things. And you might say, well, do we do stuff like that? Well, yeah, we do that with, I like this verse. This says exactly what I want to do. But when God speaks over here, he must have just been talking to other people, right? Or it doesn't apply to my situation. Or I can dismiss it and say that it says something kind of different because surely God understands our world today is just a little bit different than it was back then. And so we just don't need to do it quite that way. I mean, do we do stuff like that? Do we hear people do stuff like that? Oh, we certainly do. And when we do that, what we do is we de-emphasize and we miss out on the fact that all of God's truth is good for us. And so this inquiry of the Sadducees revealed that their belief, okay, their belief that truth can be authored by anyone, Because, see, this word question, when they said that they brought this question, it insinuates that they are the authority, that they are on equal or even a status that is beyond that of Jesus. And so when you believe that you are the author of truth, that your truth, right? We've heard people say that. Well, you know, I'm just following my truth. You go follow your truth. 
What you're doing is you're setting up what you believe and what you are saying as being equal to God or more important to God. And so when we do that, when we rest on what seems right to us, we miss out on the bedrock certainty of God's promises and truth. God never lies. His promises are always kept. And what he says is firm and something you can anchor your life to and be supported with, right? But if we say that this is truth, how about, does everything you say work out exactly like you want it to? No? Have, have you said things certainly that you thought were going to happen and they absolutely did not happen? Do we want to base our life on that or base our life on the certainty of God? And so when we dismiss the truth of Jesus and we believe it can be authored by anybody, man, we're missing out on the great benefits because we're ignoring it, aren't we? I'm focused on what I'm saying or someone else is saying versus God. And so the Sadducees, they revealed that truth can be selectively applied, right, regardless of context. Since the words of Moses deal with regulating a means of taking care of a widow and not with eternal life. And so this was a real issue because as we've talked about life prior to Jesus' life and what we call the Old Testament, if you didn't have children, then who was going to take care of you in your old age? And if you didn't have enough children, who was going to help you work? Who was, people would not survive right? And so there was this provision to take care of those who could not take care of themselves. And so it had everything to do with taking care of and providing for this question, this quote of Moses had nothing to do with eternal life. But have you noticed how they took something from one thing and tried to make it into an argument for something else? Sometimes we do that with the Word of God. Sometimes other people do that. And by doing that, they have missed out on the provision and the protection of God for those in need. That this was a means that God provided for those, a widow in this instance, who was not able to take care of herself. But they also revealed that their belief of the truth can be completely ignored to justify their actions. So sometimes people just ignore the truth of God. Since this practice, this practice that we hear Moses talking about is called leveret marriage. And it's referenced in the writings of Genesis and in Ruth. And it was where a younger brother would marry his older brother's wife, a widow, to provide for her, ensure the continuation of the family line. It emphasized the inner condition of the human heart. It wasn't about slavishly following some sort of rule. So in the book of Genesis, there's an individual by the name of Onan who was punished for selfishly not providing for his family. It wasn't that he didn't go through a certain act. It was that there was a hardness and a condition of his heart where he did not care about his brother's wife. In fact, they were in that situation to begin with because unfortunately, the children of Judah had been acting wickedly. And so Onan was just acting like the rest of his siblings, unfortunately. But yet, we see great care and great consideration of a man by the name of Boaz, who not only provides for Naomi and Ruth, But by doing so, by redeeming her, by buying the land of her forefathers and being willing to use that to take care of them, ultimately marrying her, that they bring forth David, who ultimately makes the way for Jesus. The refusal to account for this allows for this exaggerated absurdity, because I could see your faces when I was reading Scripture. And I know you guys are being polite, but you're thinking, If this wasn't in the Bible, I'd be laughing right now. And if I wasn't in church, I'd be wondering, what in the world are we going to be talking about? Because they have taken a truth of God and turned it into some sort of absurdity. And see, what happens when we ignore the rest of Scripture, when we try to use it for our own means, that's what we're doing. We're turning it into some sort of mockery and absurdity. And as a result of this exaggerated absurdity of their question, it it dissuades the pursuit of God, because you hear something like that and you think, man, if that's what's in the Bible, 
I don't want any part of that. If that's what they mean by things, I don't want any of that. And so what you miss out on is the fact that God wants to be personally involved in people's lives. This idea was that God wanted to be personally involved and provide for the needs of people. It had to do with the condition of the heart. God wants our heart to be after his. And so their dismissal of this truth caused them to dismiss, to totally miss out on the beneficial nature of God. And so they're making excuses, right? Their whole question is an excuse for them not to believe. But here's where it kind of goes from the odd to the really cool. See, the Sadducees, they derided or they mocked the promise of Jesus, believing that some things were just inconceivable. This idea of resurrection, right? I mean, they didn't believe in it. They hadn't believed in it in a long time. I had a professor who joked and said, well, yeah, that's why they were sad, you see. They didn't believe in the resurrection. Uh, I know, it's almost a great dad joke. If we'd only done that on Father's Day. <clears throat> but they didn't believe in the resurrection. They, they, it was just outside their realm of understanding. They questioned Jesus about the resurrection and eternal life, but as I told you what, the book of Acts tells us they didn't believe in either one of them. In fact, they believed when you died, poof, you were gone. Now, that's not what God taught, but that's what they believed. So here they are asking a question of Jesus about something they don't believe and an afterlife that they don't think is going to happen. And so this all is a giant excuse not to follow God. And so they mocked him, and they tried to discredit this new forever life because that's what the resurrection is all about. He offered a new forever life. And so the reply of Jesus in this situation answers their question, you know, the question they didn't really think there was an answer to, even though it was a stupid question, and it shows the validity of God's promise all at the same time. And so this happens by revealing that the resurrection is found in Scripture. They didn't believe it, but I want you to listen to this. Job writes this in the first ever recorded Scripture. See, like, yes, Genesis gives us all the way back at creation, but most scholars believe that Job in the Bible was probably the first part of God's truth that was actually written down. Moses wasn't there at creation, but God gave Moses the understanding so he could write about it. But Job here is probably the first recorded words about God's interaction with people. And listen to what Job writes. But as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives and that he will stand upon the earth at last. And after my body has decayed, yet in my body I will see God. I will see him for myself. Yes, I will see him with my own eyes. I am overwhelmed at this thought. Man, can you imagine, you know, I only understand who God is through his word, but one day I will see him face to face in a body that is like this or maybe somewhat different. And we see that in Job 19, it's uh, 20, uh, verses 25 through 27. But we don't just see the resurrection in Scripture. We also see this promise revealed, revealing the resurrection in the very name of God. Now you say, okay, God's got a lot of cool names, right? But here, catch this. Moses tells us, that God's name at that burning bush is what? I am. And you think, man, that is a crazy, silly name. But yet, this I am, Jesus affirms that not just that, but God says what? I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He, he says, this is my name forever. Now, let's break down this a little bit. So, this forever name is a present tense verb, a verb of being, right? In the present tense, a verb of being of those who are alive. I am the God of Abraham not what? 
not I was the God of Abraham. It's not that he pulls himself away, and it's not that Abraham was. What you're catching is that Abraham is. And though Abraham's body has decayed, Abraham is with his God. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is not was their God. And so the very name of God himself, the ones that the people of Israel wouldn't even say, right? They wouldn't speak it. It was so special. In fact, when they wrote the name Yahweh, they wouldn't put the vowels in it because it was that special. But yet the very name of God teaches us and validates the resurrection. But not just that, but by revealing that the resurrection in his own words and his own life. So let's think about this. Jesus spoke of it directly and specifically to his disciples on three different occasions. We've already covered those. We see it in Mark 8, Mark 9, and Mark chapter 10. Not just that, but because Jesus has said these words in the group of his disciples and others, it will be the witness of others that will be used against him at his trial to put him to death. They will say, we heard him say he will tear down the temple in three days and raise it back up. And so the very words of Jesus about the resurrection himself are going to be used against him at his coming trial to put him to death. But also, let's not forget that the ultimate miracle that caused the religious leaders to lose their minds in the beginning was that he raised Lazarus from the dead. And so when Jesus came into Jerusalem from Bethany on that Sunday, when everybody shouted and were throwing their clothes on the ground so that Jesus wouldn't have to walk on the dirt and they were doing that whole palm branch thing, do you know who was a part of that big parade coming into town? Lazarus and all of Lazarus' friends and the people from Bethany who were giving what? Testimony to the resurrection. And here they all came into the temple of God. And so his name tells us about it. Scripture tells about it. Jesus' own words. In fact, the proof of the appearance of Jesus on Easter and beyond causes the Sadducees to have to create this lie with the Romans to say, tell everyone somebody came and took his body in the night and that it was his disciples who did it. Because let's be honest, the very presence of Jesus himself proves the resurrection, does it not? They didn't just see him in Jerusalem they saw him for some 30 or 40 days. Paul tells us that there were some over 500 people, at least, who saw the risen Lord. Man, that is an amazing account. And so their derision of his promise to rise again causes them to miss out on this new life that he offers. And so you and I, man, we make lots of excuses not to follow Jesus. Sometimes we're even looking for excuses not to follow Jesus. But Mark wants us to see through these excuses and to embrace the resurrection. And so that's my question for you. Are you willing to do that? The crowd knew, the crowd that was listening to the Sadducees asked this question, they knew exactly what they believed. So you know what everybody here in the temple is thinking? This group of crazy hypocrites is asking a question of this teacher and we know it, and they know it. They don't even believe in what they're asking. And so I want you to know, when we make excuses not to follow Jesus and be faithful as believers, and when we make excuses as people who don't know Jesus to say no to Jesus, it's really obvious, right? It doesn't add up. All the proof in society and the world is there to follow Jesus, and that Jesus is not some crazy lunatic. And so are you willing to examine yourself this morning? Because you need to stop giving excuses and live faithfully for Jesus. So here's some practical things that you need to do. Stop talking about your truth, right? 
I mean, you might have some words that are pretty wise, but man, nothing accounts for the goodness of God. Stop justifying your behavior. Hey, God's okay with this. I'm okay with it. I can kind of make a mental connection and say that all this is okay. You know, you and I are really good at justifying doing bad things. We see it all through society, right? I mean, we've got an entire culture right now that is justifying really bad choices. Yeah. You need to stop ignoring your Bible. Whether you read it in a book that's on your lap, whether it's on your tablet, whether it's on your phone, we've got this collection of the most awesome truth of God himself that's written so we can know him and apply it to our lives and live the best life possible. And yet, if we're not careful, what do we do with it? At the best, sometimes, we'll come hear some guy talk about it for 30 minutes. Man, it needs to be more of our life than that. I mean, we spend way more than 30 minutes on social media every day. What are you filling your mind and heart with? No one wants to be like the Sadducees. After reading about them today, do you want to be like them? Well, then stop making excuses and stop looking for excuses. Let Jesus breathe that new life into your relationships. Encourage you to live all for him. I mean, that's what it's all about. The prophet Isaiah says that the resurrection brings joy. Man, there's something in my life that world situations can't take away. No matter how bad the world is, no matter what happens to me, the joy of Jesus is always here. I mean, I want to be happy, but happy comes and goes. But joy? Mm -hmm. If you realize your life's missing something, it's time to examine. But what about you that don't know Jesus this morning? Maybe you don't know him. Well, you need to stop giving excuses and experience the resurrection. The resurrection is real. We've talked about it, right? We need to stop clinging to your old way of life. Because let's be honest, you know that your way of life isn't working. I don't need to talk you into it. I don't need to start laundry listing the dumb stuff that's going on because you know it. And so are you willing to say, man, I'm willing to stop this because this is so much better. Man, that's what it's all about. Stop clinging to your way and grab on to the good promises that God offers. I want to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes this morning. I want to invite you, if you're a Jesus person, to stop giving excuses and set aside the dumb sin that's going on in your life and to be faithful. Yeah, that's a tough ask. I don't know what's going on in your life. But if you claim the name of Jesus, you've already said Jesus is better than everything else. So stop with the sin and start with the yes of Jesus. And if you don't know Jesus, today you can ask him to forgive you of your sins. And if you want to do that, as soon as I say amen, as soon as we get ready to start singing, come forward, talk to me, and I would love to tell you about Jesus. Because here's the choice. The resurrection is real no matter what. The prophet Daniel says, many of those whose bodies lie dead and buried will rise up, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting disgrace. That means when you and I die, we don't die. We are raised again. And some of us who know Jesus will be in heaven. And if you reject Jesus, this isn't me, but if you reject Jesus, what you're choosing for eternity, not God, but you, is hell. Man, my excuse got me to hell. That's not what I want for my life. It's not what I want for you. And so if you want Jesus, then choose him and let him resurrect your life this morning. Dear Jesus, we do thank you for today and for your truth, God. We thank you that as we look at these people who ask this absurd question, that we can see, God, that it was you providing a way. But beyond that, we see, God, that if we set aside our excuses, that we can see the goodness of God, that you change our relationships in our life, God, that you give us something that we can cling to, and that you do something new in us that can't be done by anybody but you. God, help us to see that and to want that over our excuses today. In Jesus' name, amen.